This is Cost Talk with Evan Costman, and you are listening to episode 10. This week on the podcast, we have Mike Belkin, a former professional tennis player, retired currently. Right. Um, so, first off, thank you for being on the podcast. You're welcome. You are not only the first person on the podcast to have his own Wikipedia page, but you are the first one to be in the Hall of Fame, so that means a lot for you to take the time to be on. We'll get into all of that and more, but I want to start at the beginning. Your family moved to Florida in 1958 when you were only 13. 11. Oh, when you were 11? 11, yeah. Oh, so they even got it wrong. They, they got it wrong. It was 11. Okay, so the Canadian Tennis Hall of Fame should change that. I know. I read that your parents decided it was the best move for your tennis career. What was the Canadian tennis landscape like back then, and how important do you think that move was to further challenge yourself? Well, my parents had always been coming to Florida on vacations every year when I was young, and they uh, decided I started liking tennis, and there was no indoor tennis courts in Canada. I mean, in Canada at that time, or Montreal especially, there was no indoor tennis courts, so you could only play like three months a year. So my dad said, you know, why don't we move to Florida, get our green cards and move to Florida, and that's what he did. He decided to finally move to Florida. Okay. Not for my tennis, he also had a business in Montreal and he uh, decided to sell the business and go into something else, but come to Florida because the weather was much nicer in Florida and it was better for me to play tennis, easier. So it was mutually beneficial for all exactly. parties. Okay. Exactly. What attracted you to tennis? Well, when I was a young boy, I'll never forget, I was seven, eight years of age. I would go hang around with my father, he would take me to an indoor tennis club where he played every day, and I'd sit there and watch him eat a sandwich. He never asked me to play tennis. He never forced it on me. But I could see that I was watching him, and I was eating a sandwich, and then I'd go get a drink at the at the uh, con- the concierge there, and I, then I'd come back and sit and watch, and then he went back to the office and worked. So that's when I finally, I, for, first time I saw tennis all the time, in the, in the mornings and the afternoons. He loved it, so... That's why they ended up moving to Florida. I read that he was your first uh, instructor. What lessons do you think he taught you about the game? He never really taught me. I just moved, we moved across a park in Miami Beach, Florida. I'll never Mm -hmm. forget this. And there was a backboard there. He never said go out and play tennis. But I started going out and hitting balls against the wall and asking people to play. And uh, playing then every weekend, I got a little better. And when I was playing all the people, I decided to... My dad said, well, let's go play tournaments. I started playing a tournament every weekend when I was 11 years of age. Oh, wow. And that's what, basically, I got into it. And I never really liked the game. I used to always rush off the court, go play the other sports with the kids, like baseball, football, well, what else, basketball and track. And I never liked that. I'd play for an hour first every day, and then I'd go play the other sports. So it felt like a chore in a way. I don't know. I like the other sports, playing with kids and running around and catching a football with the other kids in games. But tennis, I just did my thing for an hour. But I worked hard when I was out there for that hour mm. or an hour and a half, whatever. I always worked hard and then ran to play the other sports. But then I got into turn. Then I enjoyed winning. I mean, I was winning and winning and then you win all the time and started getting into it. So was it sort of begrudgingly that you noticed that you were winning that maybe you should do this compared to the other things that you might have enjoyed more? Yes, then about 11, by 12 or 13, I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm winning all the time, all these tournaments, I'm beating all the older men who are like 15 years of age, I mean, beating older kids already, and then I decided to go play tournaments, and that's why I decided to uh, stay tennis full-time and drop the other sports that I was playing. So what was that like? You, you were playing older men and you were beating them. To, right. What was that feeling like? Well, I knew I was pretty good. I just had a tremendous desire to win. I wanted to win. I had to beat the guy even if I wasn't feeling well, but I, I had to win. No, that's the passion yeah. that drives all exactly. of us, right? Wanting to win. And you found that way to do it right. through an outlet in tennis. Right. It wasn't easy. I mean, you know, you got to practice and then you go play tournaments and it's, uh, it was tough, but I did it. So, but... That's good. I enjoyed the winning, winning, winning every weekend, getting a tournament. I mean, I remember one time in my career, I won 80, like 97 straight matches in a row and then national championships in the United States and then I won state tournaments and all. that was it, played international tournaments and you know, you know you're good when people start asking you to give you free rackets, companies and pay your way around the, uh, world to go play tournaments. So what was that like getting all that fame and attention at such a young age? Well, I knew I was good. Mm. I knew I was good. I, I, I knew I was good right when I was like 13, 12, 13. And then I 
you know, I felt good about it, you know. Went to school, they would announce me on the loudspeaker all the time. Every time I wanted a term, oh, Mike Belkin wanted another term, and the principal would say, I'd like to congratulate him, and it was, you feel good about it, you know. What can I tell you? That was it. That, no, that's great. That's more than mm-hmm. most accomplished, especially at that age. Then I got an article in the Sports Illustrated magazine. There's a uh, famous writer and did a whole three-page article on me with Sports Illustrated, a young kid getting a... I was just about to bring that up. Right. So how crazy was it that these guys are coming to you? Exactly. What, what was that feeling like when you're just being recognized by other people for... I mean, your, you're good. Yeah. You're good at something or successful at something. And I remember he came to my house, this guy... Frank the Ford, very famous, became very famous, not because he wrote the article on mm-hmm. me, but he just became a very famous writer for Sports Illustrated, and uh, I'll never forget that article, you know, it was like, imagine being a, a 17-year-old, 16-year-old kid in, in, a, in a big magazine like that in the United States. Must have been the coolest kid at high school, then. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> tennis wasn't so big in those days, I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, tennis got bigger in the middle 70s, but it was big, but not... That big, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Wasn't on TV that much. Today, it's a big sport today. Why do you think that uh, growth well, the, happened? Well, the money the money made the game. You know, when I was playing, there was very little money in the game, and you scrounged to go ahead and get enough money to go play tournaments. And uh, But then the money came into the game when Bjorn Borg came in in 1974. They had that long hair and the uniform that he always wore all the time, the fila. And that's when the game started getting really, really popular. Mm. The sponsors wanted to start sponsoring tennis. Like, you know, this kid today, the one, the Canadian Open, I mean, it's really the Rogers Cup today. Mm -hmm. 20-year-old boy, and he beats Roger Federer today. I mean, that's huge. No, that's crazy. And this guy, Denis Shapovalov, winning, getting to the semifinal, that's huge. That builds up the game. No, honestly, it's it's great because then it excites people in their countries to get behind them. Right, to get their kids in tennis, to, you know, make them tennis players. And the kids want to become tennis players. It can only be good for the sport. No, for sure. So I want to take us back to the early 60s. You were a highly recruited individual going to college. Right. What was the recruitment process like? When you become a national champion in the United States... All the schools want you, uh, all the co- uh, colleges want you, and you get an invitation, you get a free education for from every course. California was offering me scholarships, all the big tennis schools were offering me scholarships, and then I finally wanted to stay near my home in Miami, so I went to the University of Miami, but I only stayed there two years, because I wanted to go play tennis. So that's why you chose Miami, just because it's close to home. Right, close to home, and... Yeah. You could get a home-cooked meal every yeah, now once and in a while. But I lived on campus, though, so I didn't go home too much. Your son actually gave me a little bit of backstory. Apparently, you got redshirted your first year at school. Well, that's the way it is. It, that's the way. In my day, it was always, you couldn't play as a freshman in those days. You had to wait a year and then play as a sophomore. Do you think that stunted your development? No, or do you think matter. it was good for your no, game? No, it didn't matter. I just played tournaments on the side, or I played in college. and no, I was beating all the guys in, uh, who were ahead of me. And, but I couldn't play on the, the matches, but they were, I was beating them all anyways, all the kid, guys. Next year, I was number one on the team. I was going to say, it didn't hold you back in no, any way. Cause, no. So you've played against some very iconic names, right. including Arthur Ashe, right. Thomas Coach, and Stan Smith, among others. Right. Who was your favorite player to play against, and what was going against them made them so special? Well, they were champions, too, and I had to beat them, too, and they, they beat me along the way, too, but... Uh, it was great playing these guys. Arthur Ashe, I beat him five times. Stan Smith, I uh, beat him twice. And Jimmy Connors, I beat. I beat all the top players in the world mm-hmm. at one time in my day. And that was uh, very good for me. I got the quarterfinals, the Australian Open, and, you know, and that was it. That was it? That was it, yeah. During a match, what did you do to find their weaknesses, find their strengths? Well, you know them. You know them from watching them play other matches, see what they like, what they can do, and what they can do, and how they hurt you. I remember watching players that before I had to play them, they were playing a match before. I'd hope for one guy to lose, that I wouldn't have to play that guy. It was like a contrast of styles to me, and I didn't like that. I wanted to play a guy that would suit my game. It's always about styles, and you know, but the, the game is tremendously, con- everybody thinks it's an easy game. First of all, you, you get to learn how to hit the ball. Then you got to get to learn how to play the game. And the play, playing the game takes years. Mm-hmm. It's like chess players playing the chess game or 
uh, baseball. You don't just get these things overnight. You are always playing matches and tournaments and trying to figure out different styles for different people. I mean, it's really an incredible game. But you got to keep developing. No, it's good. like the famous saying where it takes a thousand hours to actually master something. Exactly. I teach the kids today. They come, let's say, they come to me and they or Mark, my son, they want to take uh, tennis lessons or whatever. And they tell me they're good. The kids are good. And I keep telling the parents today, that's not the way I learned how to become a tennis player. I learned how to become a tennis player by playing other people. The kids today, all they want to do is take lessons and hit with the pro. There's no pressure in that. What they have to do is they have to go out and play matches, but the parents don't believe that. They're always brainwashed into taking lessons with a tennis pro. There's no pressure on that. The no. pressure comes from playing tournaments and matches, but the parents, that's why the kids aren't, many kids aren't getting better because they don't take, they don't play matches every day. I played matches every day, which so I asked everybody to play. That's how I became a tennis player. It's stacking yourself up amongst your peers exactly. and seeing how you stack exactly. up. Exactly, but I always figured out how to play, the, I learned how to play the game. It's two different things. Everybody can hit a tennis ball, mm. but it takes years to learn how to play the game, actually play the points, the game, the styles of the other person. It's absolutely incredible when the parents tell me, no, I want more lessons, more. I mean, it's great for the pros to make a living, but to become a tennis player, you don't get better taking lessons from a pro or just hitting. You become like a robot hitting balls. No, mm. you get better by playing matches and tournaments. But yeah. not very many people, kids who play this game, get to where they get, have to get to. They don't. It's very difficult. People, the parents spend fortunes to make their kids tennis player dreaming about it. Mm. And it's very difficult to get to become a tennis pro. No. Really, it's, it's unbelievable. And only the top guys in the hundred make money. And it's very it's difficult. No, for sure. But it's worth the effort that you put into the climb exactly. if you can make exactly. it into those top 100. And it's good for the kids too because if you stay out of trouble, tennis is good and all that. If you don't, you're playing instead of getting into drugs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good. And, and it's good because it teaches you how to be an individual right. because you're alone you on the court. Yeah. Right. Kids have to be disciplined. If someone hits you 50 balls, one time you got to hit 51 to win that point. No one's going to give it to you. There's always someone on the other side of the net that is there and wants to beat you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to beat that person. If they hit 100 balls, you got to hit 101 balls. There's actually a great saying about that too. Uh, we mentioned it uh, two episodes ago right. with Steve, where it was the person in number one has to work as hard or even harder than the person who's in number two. Exactly. Otherwise, the person who's number two is going to eclipse the exactly. person in number one. You can't be complacent. Right. What do you think the hardest part is in developing your individual game? Uh, that's a good question. You don't have to practice that much, but you've got to practice hard. When you're out there now, you've got to work hard mentally. Mentally, mentally. It's mentally... The whole game is mental. Whoever is stronger, anybody can hit a ball, but you've got to be mentally strong out there. But you don't have to play five hours. The parents tell me they're sending their kids, they're going to do homeschool, and then they're going to play tennis seven hours a day. You're not going to become a tennis player, though. It's a waste of time, homeschool. The kids have to play on the court one or two hours a day, the most, and then play tournaments on the weekend. Mm -hmm. and that's how you become a tennis player. No, that's completely fair. It's actually sad to see if some people are being homeschooled, because if they don't make it, what do they finished. have to fall back on? They have yeah. nothing to fall back on. These parents spend fortunes on the kids with lessons and, and homeschool and this, and they do it all wrong. But the, the trouble is, everybody is... Telling them nowadays, oh, you got to play more tennis, you got to have lessons all day long. No, I tell the opposite. I'm not so sure that people believe us. Hmm. I never had a coach in my life, even though my dad helped me, but he wasn't a coach. He was just a part time instructor, but he didn't really know the game. But I learned the game by playing matches every day and tournaments on the weekend. So you were basically self taught. You did it self taught. Individual. And I can tell you three other guys that made that I know very well, a guy named Eddie Dibbs, he was ranked five in the world, he got the five, he never had a lesson in his life. He grew up in Miami Beach like I did, mm -hmm. and he went to the same practice every day against anybody that he could find and then played a tournament. It's, it, it's very exactly. rare today, I guess. It's very yeah. rare today. The equipment's better today, the, the rackets are better, the, the conditioning is better today, but it's the same game, you still gotta learn how to play the game. And that's it. 
Let's take a quick break from the interview with Mike to remind you to please rate and subscribe wherever you get this podcast. If you subscribe, you will never miss an episode. And if you rate the podcast, it helps the visibility of future episodes. We've been gaining some momentum and I really hope to continue that. If you wanted to get in touch with us, you can give us a follow on Twitter and a like on Facebook under the username Costalk. I also want to mention we launched the YouTube page last week. If you could subscribe to it, it would be greatly appreciated. I appreciate everything that's been done already, and I know I ask a lot, but I want this podcast to be bigger and better than ever, and I can't do it alone. Thank you for everything, and let's get back to the interview with Mike. Chris Everett, a former number one female tennis player, gave you the recognition that you were the first person to use the two-handed backhand because she was recognized as being the first female to use the two-handed backhand. And she wanted to make sure people knew you did that. What was that like to, one, get recognized from another player, especially someone who was as well known as her? Yeah. No, it was very... When I saw that, it was very good to me because I knew that I was the first to play tennis. And then for her to put it in her book... To say that uh, when she was growing up, she copied uh, Mike Belkin, a former top 10 player in the world, and who also hit a two-handed backhand, and she, I was the first one to really hit the two-handed backhand. What was it about it that made, that it agreed with you that you actually pursued it or tried to use that two-handed backhand? Well, I was natural. When I hit, I was hitting, I played golf lefty. I mean, I played baseball lefty, so I was really a lefty. But in my day, everybody hit with one hand. No one hit with two hands. And so... I was the first kid, first person to hit with two hands out there. And is it crazy to see it's adopted by almost everyone Everybody, today? 99% of the players are using two hands today, which is amazing to me. Do you see yourself as an innovator in well, that way? I would think, I would, I feel like I'm one of the innovators. I was the first man player, so I feel it followed through evolution through me. Someone always copying me and then copying someone else. Hey, this two hundred thing is works. You understand? Mm-hmm. It does. You look at all the boy Borg, and then you got um, who else? Uh, Djokovic, Nadal. They're all two handers, so it must be good for something. You know what I'm saying? There's still a few one handers around, like Federer, and uh, it's very. Most of the players today, ninety nine percent of the players today, are two handers. It just felt more natural. More for natural you. and more control. More power. I was actually going to bring that up. What do you think about the developments in the game? Like, uh, how do you think the the rackets and everything would play even well, back then? Would they made everybody better? Well, your small little wooden rackets. The yeah. head was like the size of like uh, foot by foot, and it was very small. But we always learned to hit the ball in the center of the racket. We could still get power from those wooden rackets because the guys were strong. They could serve 150 miles an hour. So it's the same thing basically, but. Today, their equipment is better. They got better. Um, uh, they got better strings. The strings are a little bit better, and the rackets are a little bit graphite, so they're stronger. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's the same game. You still have to learn how to play this game, and that takes years how to learn. No. Some people learn it earlier. Some people learn it later. It, but it takes years. And hopefully, it clicks. Hopefully, yeah. it clicks. Can be healthy. Can get injured. I mean, there's things like that. Uh, actually, it's funny you bring up injuries. So I was reading in your bio, injuries sort of started the descent. I don't know what the nice way to put that is. Um, how much do you think they hampered whatever? The injuries. Yeah. I had injuries. You did. My career. Towards the end of my career, I had a knee operation on my knee. In those days, you had to wear a cast after the operation and it took you six, seven months. And I was impeded by that. And then I always had a wrist injury. I had to take cortisone. There's always a, listen, a guy like Federer here, who was number one in the world, and he still is or whatever, but he's been healthy all the way through his game. You know, he doesn't have one injury. You get injuries, and there's a problem. There's a problem. It takes its toll. Well, because you lose time, you're wasting time, you can't practice, you can't play six, eight months, and it's tough to come back. You lose confidence. The whole thing, the game is all confidence. Mm-hmm. How much do you think a love of a game versus just having a drive is integral into becoming the number one. I think it's both. I think you got to love the game. Mm. It's about the winning. All those guys out there today, Djokovic, Nadal, even today, they're so ingrained about winning, it's unbelievable. Federer, it's about winning. They want to win. Not the money. They don't care about the money. Mm-hmm. Although that's nice. Yeah. yeah. No, they don't even think about it. I guarantee you. They mm. want to win. They just want to win. In their life since they've been little kids, they want. 
They want to win. No. They don't want some young guy like Shapovalov coming up and beating him. He took a bad beating today, Federer. He lost yeah. today to a 20-year-old kid today mm. who's supposed to be the next superstar. Yeah. You understand? But, you know, he lost. He lost. And that's... Let's see what happens now. Losses knock you down mentally. Mm. That mentally, hey, I'm not as good anymore. I'm, I can lose to a kid, you know. It, not... It's how you respond to the losses exactly. that define you. Absolutely. Yeah. Life is about coming back mm-hmm. in life, in anything, in business or in um, marriages or whatever. Or it's always about coming back. Everybody, every, there's a saying, everybody can play good when things are going right all mm. the time. The mark of a champion is the win when things are going wrong. Have a little adversity. You understand? Adver- that's the word, adversity. That's the, that's the mark of a champion. When things are going right, anybody looks good. You understand? Mm-hmm. In every field. But when things are going a little adversity, that's when you separate the men to try to come back again. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like Jeannie Bouchard, did mm-hmm. we discuss this? Jeannie no. Bouchard did unbelievable when she first got out there. She was winning, getting to the finals of major tournaments, number five, three in the world at 19 or 18 years of age. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. She's ranked 80 in the world now. Oh. 80 in the world for being number two in the world. So now she's going to see what kind of person she is to see if she can come back. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you don't come back. If she doesn't want it, mm-hmm. she probably has plenty of money, so it doesn't matter. Let's see what happens. If she wants it, she'll come back. Absolutely, it's the winners that come back. Bring it back to your career. You were ranked number one as the number one Canadian right. five times in a six year span. Right. The Canadian game has obviously evolved since then right. over the past 30 years. We've got guys like Ronich and Pospisil right. and the new 18 year old right. phenom we discussed. Yeah, Shapo, right. yeah Dennis Shapo. Bouchard was good. And Bouchard was good. But we had the same good players in those days too. Did you? Don't think that uh, there weren't good players then. There were excellent players then. Mm. But the game wasn't as popular then. It okay. wasn't on TV that much. But there were good tennis players when we played. I, I'm sure it just Very didn't... good. We Did... had Australian great players, even Canadians were good players. So mm-hmm. but it wasn't that popular, but it became popular in the 70s. But uh, no, play, Canada's doing a wonderful job today. Whatever they're doing, they're doing it well. They got good players playing. Mm-hmm. They've developed some good players. And the kids are playing tennis all the time now. They have more indoor tennis courts here, mm-hmm. more tournaments up here. So it's good. No, Canadian it- tennis has gotten a lot better. Mm. They're actually doing a little bit better than the States is doing, to tell you the truth. Really? Yeah, the States is sort of leveled off. And So in 1994, you were inducted in the Canadian Tennis Hall of Fame. What was it like to get that recognition, and how much did that mean to you? Uh, I was in Florida at the time because I was living there. And when they told me that I, I'd been, I was nominated, they were going to give me... The, uh, being put me in the Canadian, I was very, very honored because not too many players get into Hall of Fames and and for that year there was only like two, I think they put in two every year, two or three every year. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of great Canadian tennis players, a lot of great people who invented, who started the game in tennis, who were in charge of the uh, association, so they, uh, I was very honored. It's a big thing for me. It was actually the fourth class, if I'm not mistaken. So that was it. Must have been great to be recognized right. early. Right. All right. So to end every podcast, I have my guests ask the next guest a question. Um, it shows. It builds a little bit of continuity. It represents the person. I, I think very well because it can be silly. It can be serious. So your question comes from my guest from last week, which was Zev Skolnick, and his question's a little bit silly. So he asks. Who would you rather manage your money in retirement? Would it would you rather it be Fetty Wap or would you rather it be Weird Al Yankovic? And it's okay if you don't know who either who Fetty Wap is. I have to give one name? You have to give one of the two names and why. <laughs> because I remember Yankovic. I'm gonna say Yankovic. Just because you know him. Because I know him. Yeah. You can trust him that way. Exactly. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Honestly, you, you got to trust your person. He's helping you in retirement. It makes sense. Right. All right. So do you have a question for our next guest? Yes. What is your motivation in your work? What drives you? Is it love of what you do or is it for the money? Great question. Thank you very much, Mike, for being on the podcast. I appreciate you taking the time out. And my, pr- my pleasure to be here. 
Perfect. Thank you. Incredible story, this, huh? Yeah, no, this Why? one. Why? 